It was a great day for the 4th Street School. It was a great day for her. She was coming home. As we got closer, I had to remind her of something. After all, that had been part of my job for 30 years. Got up the cigarette. What's the matter? You're afraid I'll die young. The children, we're almost there. With the singing of Atikva, the national anthem of Israel, we welcome to the 4th Street School our most distinguished graduate, Mrs. Golda Meir, former Prime Minister of Israel. Shalom to you. It is a beautiful word. It means hello and goodbye. But what it really means is peace. May peace be with you. Mr. Macy, members of the faculty, distinguished guests and children, very dear children, I have tried to think how to express my feelings on coming to my old school. Well, as I look around, well, it's amazing. Nothing seems to have changed except me. <laughs> what comes to my mind is the saying, an old Jewish saying by an ancient sage, called Hillel, he said, 
If I am not for myself, then who will be for me? But if I am for myself only, then what am I? And if not now, when? These words have meant a great deal to me all my life, and I'll tell you why. How shall I describe her? To people all over the world, she was one of the great women of this century. Some say she was the greatest. It's hard for me to judge. To me, she was my longtime dear friend. I remember when I first went to work as her assistant. I called her Mrs. Meyerson. On the second day, she said to me, Lou, would it hurt you to call me Golda, like everyone else? Yes. I want to ask, were you a good student? Did you get good marks? <laughs> well, I can remember a few A's. Uh, some B pluses, some B's. Below that, for some reason, my memory doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Meir's memory is too modest. We looked up her record. She was valedictorian for her class. Oh. Well, I hope they didn't also look up that my teachers commented that I... I was too talkative. <laughs> uh, yes, next question. Mrs. Meir, how come you left? You left what? America. Why did you leave America and go to Israel? Well, that's a very good question. Believe me, if I had been born in America, I'm sure I never would have left. But my earliest experiences were very different from that of an American child. You see, I was born in Russia. yelling out there, Shayna? They say we killed their lord. Put the lamps out! to do than hide in the dark. And he doesn't want me to do it. Well, I'm going to do it anyway, even if I could be sent to Siberia. Why? Being a Zionist. What's that? Well, 
It's Jews from all over the world getting together to make a country of our own in Palestine. Where is Palestine? You know, it's the promised land that God gave the Jews where we used to live. Can we go there now? <laughs> no, but someday we hope. You know something, Shayna? Just as soon as I can go there, I am going. Of course, uh, Palestine was ruled by the Turkish government, and, and very few Jews could go there. But human beings just can't live in such choking, terrible fear. So my parents did what many people of different religions and nationalities were doing then to escape persecution and uh, the poverty of Europe. We immigrated to America. Thank you. How come you picked Milwaukee? Well, my father was a carpenter. And this is very fond work. I don't remember much. I was only eight years old. Did you make up your mind then that you wanted to be a prime minister? No, no. <laughs> oh, such a job I never wanted. <laughs> Not even on the day I was elected. No, no. I wanted to become a teacher. I thought teaching children was the finest work a person could do. But my parents had different ideas, though. They wanted me to get married. Did you have any boyfriends? Of course I had boyfriends. Why not? But then somebody special came along. Well, he was maybe not a boy anymore. He was older than I was. Was he nice? <laughs> I thought so. He was a sign painter when he had work, which wasn't very often. The first person I ever knew who really loved poetry and music, we used to go to concerts together. Concerts in the park, that is. They were free. The saleswoman warned me. She said, what did I expect for 10 cents? No. I mean, it isn't going to rain. It isn't thunder. Are you sure? If it is, God is thundering in perfect time with the music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if I embarrassed you, Morris. Oh, it's not my fault you're so witty. Do you really think so? That was an extremely humorous remark. <laughs> Thank you. I suppose I owe you an apology, too. I should have complimented your new hat. Do you really like it? It's very nice. For 10 cents. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Golda. I would like to discuss something with you. It doesn't have to be now. Let me know when would be a good time to discuss a, a serious subject. Now is fine. The subject is marriage. As it concerns you and me, do you mean? I don't mean President and Mrs. Woodrow Wilson. 
<laughs> Golda, I know I don't have a lot to offer outside of a phonograph that could use some new needles, but you yourself said it's the first one you ever saw that didn't have a horn. That's true. And I love you, Golda. I love you very much. Do you really want to marry me? I'm not an easy person. My father says I'm totally intransigent. I don't believe that your father said that. You're right. What my father says is I'm as stubborn as an ox. <laughs> but the reason is I know what's important to me. Well? You are. I love you, Morris. You know I love you. <laughs> so, after that, what's to be intransigent about? Palestine. Oh, Golda. Are you still so hypnotized by this romantic Zionist business? I'm going to live in a kibbutz. It's a hard life from what I've been told. Even dangerous sometimes. Romantic, it's not. So, why get into it? Because this is the dream I've had. Ever since I was a little girl in Russia, frightened for my life. The dream that we can have the same peace and security other people have. The only way we're ever going to get it is in a Jewish homeland. Morris, if I am not for myself, who will be for oh, me? Golda, this is America. There are no pogroms in America. And I say, God bless America. God bless this beautiful country forever. But millions of Jews are not here and never will be. Morris, if I am for myself only, what am I? Don't you think I'm concerned, too? It's just that I don't see any chance for a Jewish state in Palestine at this time. When was there a better time? When did we have a Balfour declaration from the British government? Quote, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. That's very nice. But they don't set a date. Morris, if not now, when? Your friend Hillel didn't know that your other friends, the British, would be fighting a world war. And the Turks would be the ones running Palestine? But the British will win and they'll drive the Turks out. In the meantime, you can't even get there. But as soon as I can. So you're saying, if I won't go, you won't marry me? I can't very well, can I? But if I'll go, you will. I'd love to marry you, Morris. I'm sorry, Golda. I'm not going. I wish you'd think about it. Maybe you'll change your mind. No, Golda. Don't count on it. Never. a better sign than that with my eyes closed. Shalom. Shalom. You're the Myersons. Yes, this is Morris Myerson, my husband, and I'm Golda. Joel Nasser, membership committee. Hello. Hello. You should have waited to hear from us. Well, we did wait almost a month in Tel Aviv. Using up almost all of our money, I must tell you. <laughs> well, you could have saved the bus fare out here. Your application was not accepted. Not accepted? I'm sorry. Why? Why aren't we accepted? Well, it's not possible to accept everybody who wants to join the kibbutz. Maybe you can get into another one. And what are we supposed to do now? Walk back to Tel Aviv? No, we'll put you up overnight. There'll be another bus tomorrow. 
This what is, is this? This is a phonograph. I'll take care of that myself. Thank you. Palestine, we're here. It's enough already. We can go home now. <laughs> oh, Morris. <laughs> mm. What's that for? For the funniest, I really think so, the funniest joke I ever heard. <laughs> Come on. this kibbutz was the best one you were probably right at least here they know their business why'd you say that because any kibbutz that would admit me as a member would be out of business in no time <laughs> you're not laughing Golda that's only because I'm thinking some very serious thoughts <laughs> for example how lucky I am to have you. Who else would struggle halfway around the world to this place just to make me happy? As long as one of us is. Oh, Morris, darling. Do you know how much you love me? I love you even more because you're nicer than I am. Perfect end to a perfect day. They object to the music. Well. Well, yourself. Would it bother you to leave your door open, please? Open. So other people can hear the music too. Morris. They say, come on in! What kind of photograph is this? It doesn't have a horn. Right. It says that Frank is playing. You I can hear any time. See, Mona, she don't like it here. That man talks exactly like you do. Committee just reconsider your application. I'm so quick. I'm the chairman. We're accepted? On probation for three months. Then we'll see. We appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Morris, the quinine pills on the dining room table. Did you take one? No. Neither did you. We were leaving in the morning. But now we're not leaving. All right, all right. So we'll take pills in the morning. You don't expect to get malaria between now and then? Do I you? don't know. I'm not taking any chances. You go back to the music, I'll get us quinine.
get hit? Just by you. Dumb luck. Get out. Get out. Get out. Don't you know better than to cross this compound at night wearing white? I just came here today. What is it? Arab sniper. What did you think the barbed wire was for? The guns? Now I know. You wear this. There will probably be no more shooting tonight. You can go to your room. But you might like to think about it. Whether you should stay here. Where are you going? I'm going for quinine. I think I should tell you what a kibbutz is. It is a community of people that live and work together. Uh, they eat together in a common dining room. The children are cared for in the kibbutz nursery. Nobody owns anything by himself, but together they own everything. In those days, most of the work was agricultural. Was it real hard on the kibbutz? I mean the work. Oh, boy, was it. Tells me. I'll be sure. I thought this was a progressive kibbutz. It's positively Victorian. A woman's place is in the kitchen. I saw women in the olive grove. Like you never saw a man in here. You know when you will see men on kitchen work? When we get women on the assignment committee. Gabi, I'm so sick of it. I'm telling them tonight. They better put me on something else. Tell them in terms of a specific assignment. Livestock, even poultry. Really? Last really, what's wrong with that? You'd rather feed chickens than feed people? That's a funny way to look at it. Nobody likes working in the kitchen. Well, I don't exactly love it either. But I don't like chickens. I think I'd be afraid to be alone in a room with a live chicken. <laughs> you mean in America, there are no chickens that aren't cleaned and plucked? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, the water's off again. I'll go and get a man. What's the trouble with the water, Gabby? The valve is clogged. Is it hard to fix? Just hit it with a hammer. Then why do we need a man? Because the valve is on the roof.
here. Morris and Goldman. Right, so, uh, well, um, I have no objections to him. He does the best he can. But I have serious doubts about her. She would turn this kibbutz upside down. Can you be more specific? She's already trying to institute hot cereal for breakfast. What do you mean, instead of herring? Yes, and that is just one of her ideas. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be honest. This is a highly personal attitude that I don't expect anyone else to share. But I can't stand her ironing dresses. I share it. Explain that, please. The rest of us, when we change clothes for dinner, we go to the laundry and we take a clean folded dress off the shelf, and that's good enough for us. But she has to iron her dresses. Oh, I see. Anything else? Sometimes she wears stockings to dinner. Well, uh, the established tastes and attitudes of the group are very important. On the one hand, uh, we should not be too harsh. And on the other hand, we should not be too lenient. In the balance, I should say that she is uh, an absolute joy to have around. <laughs> I agree. <So> do I. <laughs> Thou beside me. Singing in the wilderness. Ah, wilderness were paradise in now. <laughs> I wonder how Omar Khayyam knew to write these words for me personally. <laughs> You're glad, aren't you, Morris? Yes, I'm glad. I'm glad we're still alive after three months in this place. <laughs> ah, you can joke. <laughs> you worked hard. You've made him accept you. Now we're kibbutzniks. You should be very proud. My darling Goldie, I've always been very proud of you. <laughs> kibbutzniks. We don't own anything. We never will. And yet we own all of Mojave. The land, food trees, everything's ours. Doesn't it make you feel rich? So, what can we afford now? A pure Sarah automobile. <laughs> I was thinking of a baby. I didn't hear that. I'm saying I think we should have a child. Really? When did the committee tell you we could go to work on this child? What night? What hour? What committee? Well, how can we do it without help from some committee? Isn't there a committee to plan everything around here? No, 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 Golda. No baby. Not now. Well, when then? I'll tell you when. When we're living someplace else, not here. Why, Morris? Why? Because I don't want my child raised by other people. Fed, washed, held. Not by his parents, by someone else. Put to bed. I don't know, a house in a nursery with strangers. The child wakes up crying in the middle of the night. Who comes to it? A committee. Morris. No, thank you, Gold. No, no. If I'm going to be a parent, I want to be a parent, not a visitor. 
So where are you going? I'm going out, because I know you're going to try to talk me into this, like you do everything else. I wouldn't do that. Not to you, and not to the baby. All right? All right. Considering this discussion, you won't be angry about what I've got to do now. What you have to do? Well, now there's no reason for me not to agree to what they've asked me. Who asked you? They want me to go to Haifa for a month for a management course. If you want to go, go. Good night, Golda. Good night, Morris. I can see you feel bad about the baby. I'm sorry. It's no baby to feel anything about. I was thinking about the course. What is the course? How to raise chickens. Wonderful. Where'd you get the record? Surprise. A gift from your sister in Milwaukee. Oh. I'll play the other side. You gonna come and dance? You can dance this one without me. Oh, Morris, what's you tired? <laughs> Why should I be tired? My horses, they're exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> things I would like to talk to you about. First, your chickens. Let's talk about the other thing. <laughs> well, the finance committee has gone over the books, and for the first time, poultry is showing a profit. <laughs> Not only that, but it is the biggest profit of any of our ventures. <laughs> As you once said to me, Ariel, dumb luck. It is not luck at all. You are a very capable person. Whatever you do, you do well. So, we want you to be a delegate to the Histadrut. Me? Oh, no, Ariel. I, I couldn't. It's only a labor union. It's the union. It, it's as big as a government. I wouldn't know what to do. I could give you a few pointers. 
I am a delegate also. Please, Golda, come with me. I will not let you say no. Ariel, my Hebrew's so bad. Speak English. They will listen to you. You have a, a way of saying things that makes people listen. What's that? Go inside. Tell everyone to stay put. Turn out the light! Nahum! Over here! A raiding party. How big? I don't know yet. Are they after the animals? No, I think they're, they're heading after us. They've just broken into the compound. We have all lived through these things before. Uh, who is assigned the guns this week? I have one. Come on, guns. Have one too. Go and get them and bring them here. Understood? No place else. What's wrong? Nothing, nothing. A phonograph. I'll get it. You get the gun. You can get up now. It's all over. What? What's all over? The exercise. We are the Haganah. It, it is not an attack. It's a Haganah training exercise. I want to know who is in charge here. I am. My name is Yuval. I'm a sergeant. What the hell kind of exercise do you call this? A totally unauthorized kind. If you want a Jewish army, you have to put up with Jews training. Who I train here? Naturally, a proper training camp would be better. Trouble with that is if the British catch us at it, we'll do our next exercise in prison. We're not allowed to exist. Remember? Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want you to worry. It's only Vivax malaria. It's the mildest form. How do you know? I read about it in the library. It comes and it goes. I thought I'll take enough quinine. One day it'll just go. Oh, Dr. Myerson, I presume. Oh, I'm not a doctor, Goldie, but I know what will cure me. You're going to leave the kibbutz. You don't mean that. You're just saying it because you're sick. No, I made up my mind last night. Why? What is it? Pride? I didn't want to take the gun. I had to. No, the gun. It's not the gun, Golda. It's not the gun. Not exactly. It just showed me once and for all I'm not the right person for this existence. I can't handle anything about it. Now, Golda, I don't want to spend the rest of my life feeling sick and useless. Where will you go? It's up to you. If you'll come with me, I'll stay in Palestine. If not, I'll go back to America. Oh, Golda, I know you don't want to leave the kibbutz. I didn't want to leave America. You asked me to change my mind. So, maybe this time you'll change your mind. Morris, darling. If you leave, I leave. 
Wait, please. I want you to have this. Goodbye. Boots, which I was very unhappy about. And we went to live in Jerusalem. And the years passed. Uh, Morris became a bookkeeper, and I became the mother of two children. What were the names? Our sons was Menachem and our daughters Sarah. How did you like Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem is a wonderful city. But Morris's wages were terribly low, and there was never enough money to feed the children. I have to say that those years were the worst years of my life. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. You just heard all the Arabic, I know. How much is the chicken today? That one, 60 piastres, special to you. Give me 20 piastres worth. Lovely oranges from Jaffa, full of juice. No, this is all I need. That's uh, one pound ten, please. That's ten piastre, that's a pound. This is not a one pound note, please. No, of course not. It's a credit union script. I don't take it. Everybody takes it. My husband works for the credit union, and this is how they pay him half the time. Madam, I know why you come to me instead of the Jewish shops. Because you owe the money and they won't take your script. Look, I don't have to stand here being insulted. I've got two children and no food at home. Now, you've taken my script before. Why won't you take it now? I have to pay a discount to get rid of it. Look, I'll give you another ten piastres. It's all I have. Is that enough? No, madam. It'll have to be. I've got no food for my children. Stop! I will call the police! Stop! Shorty! Very shorty! Alexander! Shorty! God, Ariel. How are you? What are you doing here? 
Have you left the kibbutz too? <laughs> no, no, I'm uh, sort of on loan to the history group. <laughs> I've been in Jerusalem about a year, and uh, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. And Morris? Fine, fine, no more malaria. What about your wife? I heard you got married. Yeah, to, uh, to Gabby. You remember her from Mojave? Yes, I remember Gabby. <laughs> She's fine. And uh, where are you working, Golda? Oh, I'm sort of retired. You're not working? Well, I wouldn't call bringing up two small children exactly loafing. Well, I wouldn't call it anything very much, considering how badly we need your capabilities. What appears to be the difficulty, sir? There is no difficulty, Sergeant. My good man, will you accept this uh, pound note in exchange for this miserable credit union script? Pleasure, sir. All right, come on, it's all over. Come on, Granddad. Off you go. Madam! Madam! Fadali. Nishan el Walad. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. You are a born diplomat. <laughs> what kind of a job would this be? Part-time job. No, no, full time. You really think? You can handle a full-time job with everything else. I've got no choice. That's the job. Secretary of the Women's Council. Ariel must be a big man in the history route. If he can offer you something like that. They need someone who can speak English fluently. jobs in Tel Aviv. Hmm. <laughs> He's got some hell of a nerve trying to talk you into Tel Aviv when I work in Jerusalem. He didn't have to try very hard. I took the job, Morris. Eat your soup while it's hot. Never mind about the soup. You wouldn't say that if you knew what I had to go through to get a piece of chicken for us. Golda, what are you going to do? Walk away from me? Walk away from the children? Of course not. The children will come with me. And who'll take care of them all day while you're working? My sister will help. My mother and father are coming out next month. I can get very good babysitters through the Women's Council. So you have it all figured out? Yes. What about me, Golda? What do you have figured out for me? A job in Tel Aviv, as soon as you can find one. And in the meantime? You could visit us on weekends. Oh, Golda. Tell me it's not definite, Golda. Tell me you wouldn't make a decision like this without at least discussing it. No, I've discussed enough. With who? With myself. How many more years am I supposed to throw away fighting with shopkeepers? I came here to work and to build a homeland. This is not something I feel like doing. It's what I started out to do with my whole life. And nothing's going to stop me anymore. I should have gone back to America while I had the chance, before the children were born. Morris, don't feel that way. Please give things a chance to work for all of us. 
I'm going to try very hard to make them work. I promise you. It was some years before Golda could bring herself to face up to the failure of her marriage. But, as of this point, it was as good as finished. There is a type of woman who cannot let her husband and her children narrow her horizons. When such a woman becomes a working mother, her inner struggle with guilt is sometimes more than she can bear. I remember my own feelings all the time my children were growing up. And even afterward, I would wonder, what do they feel towards me? What do they really have in their hearts? Because there's no doubt I neglected them. Although I did my very best not to be away from them in one extra hour, and I always provided capable, pleasant people to take care of them. I told myself that my children had the advantage of a mother who was able to develop as a person in her own right. I could argue myself into believing that everything was fine. But there would be the moment when I was going off, leaving my children with the stranger, and they would flash me a look a look of reproach. Please don't go, stay with us. That look would be enough to destroy my whole fine argument and me along with it. For the next 10 years, while an Austrian corporal was coming to power, Golda was advancing in the Histadrut to the level of the executive committee, presided over by the political leader David Ben-Gurion. In May 1939, with World War II less than four months away, Britain issued its controversial white paper. His Majesty's government now declare unequivocally that it is not part of their policy that Palestine should become a Jewish state. <coughs> How can England just wipe out its own Balfour Declaration? the promise to establish a Jewish homeland here. You can say they are doing it for Arab oil. Or you can look for other reasons. But make sure you come back to oil. From now on, Jewish land purchases will be restricted to 5% of Palestine. Jewish immigration restricted to 15,000 per year for the next five years. And after the five years? No further Jewish immigration will be permitted unless the Arabs agree to it. Unbelievable. God knows what that lunatic in Germany is planning for all European Jews. This is their last chance to escape. Their only hope is to come here. And this is the time the British government picks to slam the door in their faces. Well, we must fight this, whatever we do. Fight the British? Damn right. The trouble with that is, when the war breaks out, the British will be on our side fighting Hitler. We will fight the white paper as though there were no Hitler. And we will fight Hitler as though there were no white paper. Fighting Hitler as though there were no white paper meant working with the British military, providing Jewish parachutists for missions in occupied Europe, training as many Jewish soldiers as the British would permit. Keep straight on, good lads, and keep those behinds down! In the training cadre, two I'll soldiers whose names were to become world famous, Ord Wingate, a British army officer, and Moshe Dayan of the Haganah. Dayan! Lower your fire. Lower, sir? I want them to feel the breeze from those bullets. Captain Wingate, they're coming quite close right now. No fear. You can't possibly hit your men. How's that, sir? The Lord is fighting for the children of Israel! 
Are you familiar with the book of Joshua, chapter 10? Then spoke Joshua, Son, stand thou still upon Givon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed. Until the nation had defeated its enemies. There was no other day like this before it or after. For the Lord fought for Israel. Have I quoted correctly? You certainly have, sir. Then I suggest you Jews put your trust in the Lord as much today as you did in the time of Joshua. We'd better. Then be kind enough to lower your fire. Yes, sir. Well, the situation in North Africa is this. The Germans are threatening to sweep through Egypt, take Cairo, and invade Palestine. That's why our top brass have decided to train a Jewish contingent. But they say they'll only train 500 men. But how can 500 stop a panzer division? The intent is to form them into sapper teams, to blow up bridges and so on. I see. Tell me, Captain Wingate, do you think the Germans will get here? I'm quite sure they will not, if only because of extended supply lines. They'll be stopped well short of here. If that happens, what becomes of our training system? <laughs> That's easy. The top brass will stop training Jews a damn sight faster than they started. Forgive my language. Captain Wingate, you're supposed to be training 500 men, so naturally you'll train only 500. But it could be. 500 at the time, and then uh, another 500. Well, that's positively splendid. You wouldn't object. <laughs> Mrs. Myerson, I won't be here very much longer. I'm being posted to Burma. Therefore, whilst I'm still in the land of Israel, I consider it my duty to help the children of Israel to take advantage of the opportunity that God has given them. Wonderful. Fighting the white paper as though there were no Hitler meant smuggling immigrants into Palestine under the guns of British destroyers. We have an incoming vessel, the Delos. Tell her to alter course. British destroyer patrolling here. Delos, huh? Greek ship? It should only be a ship. It's an inter-island ferry. I will take it to them. Mm. Then tell Shulami to come and eat. The child looks pale. <laughs> and what are you? The message into the entire Haganah? She says you should go and eat. She says the child looks pale. Can't eat till I'm relieved. Then I will relieve you, pale child. Hand over the Tommy gun. <laughs> Very nice, I must say. Yeah, you like the way I make tahina, huh? Your Trina is nice, too. I was talking about Mr. Ariel. What's your secret? A dash of cayenne pepper. And what's the secret of you and Mr. Ariel? Come on, Golda. Everybody's talking about you, too. Let them talk. What would be wrong? You know the old Yiddish saying, Manishume is nicht a I don't understand. Oh, I beg your pardon. I forgot that Sabras don't care to learn Yiddish. Rough translation. A person is not a stick of wood. <laughs> In April 1945, German concentration camps were liberated by victorious Allied soldiers who have never been able to forget the horror of what they saw.
when some of the survivors attempted to enter Palestine by sea, they were intercepted by the British and placed in camps like this one on the island of Cyprus. When did the idea of an independent Jewish state change from a distant dream to an immediate need? It was when we Jews in the land of Israel, 600,000 strong, found ourselves helpless to rescue our own people because of the policy of an occupying foreign power. That's when we learned we had to take our future into our own hands. I'm only talking about the very young children. How young? Under the age of one year. The doctors say most of them won't live through a winter in this camp. Isn't there some way they can get priority to leave Cyprus and come to Palestine? The British Foreign Office is a stickler for its own rules. And the rule in this camp is first in, first out. Oh, Sir Stuart, you and I have had many dealings in Jerusalem. In my opinion, you are much too decent to let children die for a rule like that. I knew what I was up against when I heard Mr. Ben-Gurion was sending you. You are a formidable person, Mrs. Myerson. Mind you, only these very young children. And their parents, if they have parents left alive. You can't separate them naturally. Naturally. But you do understand this will have to be done under the regular monthly immigration quota. The number going out of turn will have to be subtracted. And those who are waiting to go in turn will have to agree to let the others jump to the head of the queue. I've made arrangements to talk to some of the leaders. Now you know why Ben Gurion gave me this job. Why? Nobody else would touch it. Help us! One year I'm rotting in this place. One whole year. You're trying to say somebody who came last week should go ahead of me. No, I'm saying a child, yes. I'm sick myself. If I'll stay much longer, I'll die here. No, no, we're trying to get you all off. But the children first. Please. I understand about the children, but their parents don't mean anything to me. Children don't mean anything to me. I'll never have any. I'd like to see what's the truth by I'm on the list for next month. Are you asking me to wait another year? No, no. It, it won't take that long. How long? How long? It could be forever. No. What? No. Why? They say soon the British will stop sending us to Palestine altogether. No! no. Quiet, please. Quiet. No. We are people, not animals. We are still people. My dear lady from the Promised Land, every captured ship is a separate camp here. Every camp has its own committee. We are not authorized to act for the others. Would it be possible to call a meeting with all the committees? I could say that children are the future of any country, but let me speak of the present. The Jewish children in Palestine, the Sabras, are a miracle. How I wish you could have seen them on the beaches, meeting the ships that managed to get through. These youngsters, 16, 17-year-old boys and girls, with no memory of persecution, no experience of suffering to risk their lives, to jump into the waves and carry, actually carry the Jewish immigrants ashore. Some of the survivors told me they cried for the first time after all that they had been through. This made them shed tears. I know if you had seen these blessed children of ours, you would want every child here to have the chance to grow up like them, erect, confident, strong, 
and pure as the sun of Palestine. Flowers. Thank you. Thank you. Where did you ever get them? We made them. Our teacher from the land of Israel showed us how. Oh, you know, in the land of Israel, we love flowers, so. <laughs> On the Shabbat table, there may be candles, maybe not, and maybe not so much to eat, but there are always flowers. Is this what flowers look like? I never saw a real one. You never saw a flower? No. Dear God. Mrs. Uh, Meyerson. Well, we voted. And? And by a big majority, the children can go first. My dear friend. Thank you. You mustn't cry. You can be very, very proud of your people. They've nothing left in the world but a place on a list. And they've given that up for others. It's to the everlasting credit of the human race, Mrs. Myerson. Why should you cry? I'm crying for the children. I never saw a flower. On November 29, 1947, the United Nations voted on a recommendation of its own committee that Palestine be partitioned into an Arab state and a Jewish state, with Jerusalem internationalized. A Jewish state without Jerusalem? We could hardly imagine. And there were other things we felt were wrong, but we accepted this partition plan. We were all glued to the radio, of course, following the UN vote with pencil and paper. Yes, no, yes, no. Ten countries, including Great Britain, abstained. Thirteen, including all the Arab countries, opposed. Thirty-three, including the United States, voted in favor. As of midnight, local time, we have the right to be a state. On behalf of the Jewish agency, I want to say something to our Arab neighbors. You fought your battle against us in the United Nations. The majority of the countries in the world believe that this is how it should be. It is not what you wanted. It is not what we wanted. It's a compromise. But now we say to you, a Jewish state can be a great benefit to everyone in the Middle East. We hold out our hand to you. Let's live together in friendship and in peace.
Madonna. I think you should stop dancing. No, this is the time to dance. Tomorrow we may not be like it. I don't think you should stop dancing. If someone wants to see you. Maurice, dear, how are you? How should I be? I'm drunk. You? Nonsense. Well, the whole country is drunk with happiness. And you, Goldie, you should be the happiest one of all because you worked so hard for it. That's what I came to tell you. How nice of you, Maurice. I appreciate it very much. Well, I won't keep you from your friends. No, no, please. So I see you so seldom anymore. Golda, you know that when you made your decision, I thought it was wrong. But in terms of today, it was right. Thank you. I really thank you for that, Morris, because I think about my decision so many times. Every day is not today. You know there are days when you could possibly have doubts. Last Sunday, for instance, Menachem's recital. You knew about it. I thought, considering how busy you are and how much you travel... I knew, but I couldn't make it. I think Menachem understands that. I told him. Everybody tells him. Tells him what? With his mother. The country comes first. You went to the recital, of course. Of course. Now, how did it go? He plays the cello only a little better than Pablo Casas. <laughs> oh, no. Tell me, have you heard anything about Sarah lately? I tried to phone her, but that kibbutz is so far out of the Negev, I can't get a call through. I have the same trouble. So I went out to see her two weeks ago. You went? You went out there? I heard from friends that Sarah wasn't feeling well, and I got scared. It was the kidney problem, you know? Yes. So I wanted to take her to Jerusalem and put her in the Hadassah hospital, but the kibbutz doctors were sure it's nothing serious. Oh, thank God. Golda, you really went all the way out there. Why are you so surprised? A lot of people would be surprised to know that. A lot of people I don't care about. Well. Morris, is everything all right with you? Is there anything? Everything's fine. Couldn't be better. I came to tell you. I heard you on the radio. You were wonderful, Golden. Wonderful speech. A state, Arab guerrillas struck at the civilian population all over Palestine. They ignored the United Nations partition plan which called for a transition period before British forces pulled out. Alarmed by this crisis, we called in our two top military men for their appraisal of the situation. Yegal Yadin, Chief of Operations, and Israel Galili, the Haganah commander. So, what is the position? We can be sure of exactly two points. One, on May 15th, the British will pull out. Two, the Arabs will invade. 
What is the present strength of the Haganah? A hundred thousand able-bodied soldiers, including women. And on the other side? Four hundred thousand Arab soldiers. Four to one. The regular armies of Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Transjordan, if King Abdullah goes in with the Arab League. There is the roughest part of the problem. Abdullah's army is the Arab Legion, British trained by John Bagat Glub, with all the rest of their armies put together. If Abdullah goes in, it could be a calamity. Well, one way or another, what is your projection? We can't make any kind of solid projection. We are asking for your professional opinion. We might as well be honest. We say the Haganah is 100,000, but how many are adequately trained? 10,000. You ask for a professional opinion, but what's my real profession? Archaeology. But all right, in my opinion, we have as much of a chance to win as we have to lose. Fifty-fifty. Could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> About your note, I, I didn't want to discuss it in front of the others. But why do they think Prince Jordan would go in with the Arab League? King Abdullah himself assured me he wouldn't attack. Our latest intelligence says the opposite. I can't believe it. Well, let me see if Abdullah will meet me at the border again. No, he won't. I've made inquiries. You know our Arab expert, Ezra Danin. Yes. Danin says that Abdallah will meet you, but not at the border. This time you will have to go to him, to his capital. I'll go there. I'll go to Amman. It is risky. I wouldn't let you do it, except that if somehow, God knows how, if you could keep Abdallah out of the war, it might save us. When can I go? As soon as we get a plane. People ask sometimes if I was nervous about flying in those little two-seater planes, especially in the days when we couldn't service the engines properly. I don't think I was very nervous. I'd be too worried about whether or not I'd be able to do the jobs I was sent to do. Another reason was, I could usually tell the pilot was nervous enough for both of us. three-hour drive to Amman, most of it in Arab territory. We will be stopped at the Arab checkpoints manned by the Arab Legion. No arrangements have been made with those soldiers. Abdallah doesn't want him to know he is receiving a Jewish guest. Are you sure you should be taking such a chance? Danin, if it can save the life of a single Jewish soldier, I'll walk to Amman. Oh. I don't speak Arabic. What do I do about that? The last thing in the world you would think of doing, Golda. Keep quiet.
first checkpoint. You need to ask me any questions. A Muslim wife in the presence of her husband is not likely to be asked anything. أويت الحرمي من فضلك أويت الحرمي من فضلك يلا يا مصيري ما تخليش الزلمة بيستنى إلا سايا بشنين أويت الحرمي من فضلك أويت الحرمي من فضلك إيه هل تأخير حرمي من الشكل بتجنن شكرا يلا روح افتح الباب Smoke? Not American cigarettes. Salam, madam. Salam alaikum, Tanin Azizi. Salam alaikum, Habibi Jalali. Thank you. And what else may I do for you, Mrs. Myerson? I've already said in one word what I came here for. Shalom. Peace. That's all we want. Peace is all I want. Your Majesty, the last time you and I met, we talked about what you thought was the role of the Jews in the scheme of things. Yes. I believe with all my heart that God scattered the Jews throughout the Western world for a purpose. His divine purpose was for you to absorb Western knowledge and progress and then return to the Middle East and share it with us, your fellow Semites. You said you'd always be our friend, that you'd never join in any attack on us. I am still your friend. 
The last months we have heard that you were under pressure to join with those who intend to attack us. <laughs> pressure is something I am always under. <laughs> I sent you a note. I have never forgotten your answer. You said, Madam, I'm a Bedouin, and a Bedouin always keeps his word. I'm also a king, and a king must keep his word. But beyond all that, I never break a promise I give to a woman. What is the status of that promise now? Why do you people send a woman to deal with me? It's insulting. Your Majesty, she is head of our political action department. Why do you give such an important position to a woman? The Jews traditionally have not held women in much greater esteem than Muslims have. Perhaps this is part of the progress which, as Your Majesty believes, we were scattered throughout the Western world to absorb, inshallah, by the will of God. Inshallah. Well, I suppose I shall have to accept that. My dear madame, when I made you that promise, I was alone. Now I'm one of five. I cannot make decisions alone anymore. It might pay you to keep your independence. As long as there is peace, we'll honor the borders set by the United Nations, including international control of Jerusalem. We have accepted all that. But if we are attacked, then we have to fight. That is all off. We'll take whatever territory we can to improve our position. <laughs> With five countries against you, I cannot see you can take much territory. <laughs> you don't know how our strength has increased during the last months. I understand that you have a daughter living on a kibbutz in the Negev. Revivim? Yes. I happen to know that it is directly in the path of the Egyptian army's plan of attack. You should take your daughter away to some place safe. I appreciate you telling me this. I really do. But most of the young people at Revivim have mothers too. And if all the mothers took their children away, who would stop the Egyptians? I accept that. Your children will do their duty, and I will do mine. And the result will be a lot of bloodshed and destruction, which would be so easy to avoid. Just tell me how. Don't proclaim your state. Not now. Why are you in such a hurry? We waited 2,000 years. I wouldn't call that being in a hurry. <laughs> well, I accept that too. <laughs> well, why can't you wait for a few years more? <laughs> Here is my offer. I will take over all of Palestine. The Jews may continue to live there under my protection. You will be represented in my parliament. I will take very good care of you. You have my promise. Why do you not believe it? Promises aren't good enough for us anymore. That is the only way I can help you. Why are you so stubborn as to refuse me? Because we must have our own state. And the time is now. And if the only way we can have it is to go to war, we'll go to war. And we'll beat you. If there is a war, it will be her fault. All. Her fault! Because she is a stubborn, arrogant, damned woman. Your Majesty, let's suppose it was a mistake to send me here. 
Would it be helpful for you to meet with David Ben-Gurion? Not really. If Mr. Ben-Gurion were to announce that he had made peace with me, he would be hailed as a hero. If I were to announce that I had made peace with him, I would be murdered. Less than four years later, King Abdullah was shot dead by an Arab assassin. At that time, I thought, dear God, what would have happened to us had we been a minority in an Arab country under his protection? But on this night, I could only think about the Arab Legion joining four other armies against us. The Legion had tanks. All through the long, dangerous trip back, I said to myself, I failed. There will be war. By the middle of February, Arab guerrilla attacks had already started. In four months, the British were scheduled to leave and the Arab countries were certain to invade us. We needed arms. According to Ben-Gurion, to equip a Jewish army would require $25 million. There's only one country in the world in which we can raise so much money in so little time. I'm going to the United States immediately. I must make our American friends understand how serious the situation is. Excuse me, PG. I'm sorry to interrupt. But you can't possibly leave at a time like this. Look, what you are doing here, I can't do. But I might be able to do what you want to do in America. What makes you think that you can raise this kind of money? Two reasons. I speak the language. So do I. And the other? I'm American. No, this is too important. Let us put it to a vote. A vote? Are you calling a vote to overrule me? Why not? We are founding the only democracy in the Middle East. In a democracy, the majority rules. Those in favor of sending Golda. Opposed? None. Golda goes. No. Democracy. Do you have a proper coat? You know, it gets cold in New York. No, I don't have any coat. I'll buy one there. Uh, you could stay here next to day. You could buy one here. Probably, but Ben-Gurion insists that I take the plane this afternoon. Why? <laughs> I think he's trying to get even with me. What a lie. We don't even have time for ourselves, let alone for each other. Well, maybe when I'll get back. I probably won't be here. Really? Where are you going? Pilsen. Pilsen? What's that? There's very good beer in Pilsen. Pilsen beer is famous. Well, yeah, what is this? You're not going to Czechoslovakia to drink beer. I mean, I'm, I'm leaving right away. Now, Ariel, please tell me. Well, you know that we have been trying to put together an air force with the Hagen Army. Uh -huh. Hele Hood has managed to buy some Messerschmitt 109 fighter planes. Well, what is in Pilsen besides beer is the Skoda munitions factory. They made Messerschmitts for the Germans. And I am going there to hire aircraft mechanics. Well, of course, I know the Czech government has been selling us arms, but the situation is very unstable there now. By the time you get there, the Soviet Union could be running things. And I wouldn't trust those fellows to be any friends of ours. How do you know? They would even let a Jewish agent into the country. I don't. And I certainly don't have time to be held up at the border while they bury me in red tape. So, do you have an answer for that? Well, I uh, will parachute in. No! No, don't do it, Ariel. No, please forget the whole idea. It's all wrong for you. 
why is it wrong for me? Because, because you're too badly needed here. Let someone else go. I am one of the very few people who can speak your language. Mm. Oh, oh. For hiring mechanics, any businessman would do better. And how many businessmen do you think we have with parachute training? Hmm? The trading is one thing. This is different. What is different? We'll never see each other again. Do you really think that you can talk me out of going? Not for a minute. You have to understand, Mrs. Myerson, this is not a Zionist organization. Some of these people, maybe a lot of them, are just not interested in Palestine. And all of them are sick and tired of hearing how badly we need money. Huh? Well, frankly, they're under pressure to raise funds for institutions in America. Jewish hospitals, Jewish charities all over the country, they need money too. It might be better if you didn't address this group, Mrs. Myers. Wait, and let us set up a more favorable audience. No, I have to get through to these people. Well then, it might be a good idea if you let me take a look at your speech. I haven't prepared a speech. You mean you don't know what you're going to say? I'll know when the time comes to say it. Please believe me when I tell you I did not come to the United States only because 700,000 Jews are in danger of being killed. That is not the issue. The issue is that if the Jews of Palestine survive, then the Jews of the world survive with them. And their freedom will be assured forever. But. If these 700,000 are wiped off the face of the earth, then there'll be no Jewish people as such. And for centuries to come, all our hopes and dreams of a Jewish nation, a Jewish homeland, will be smashed. My friends, when I say that we need money immediately, I don't mean next week. I mean right now. In less than four months, we'll be fighting for our lives against cannon and armor. It is not for you to decide whether we'll fight. That decision is taken. We will fight. We'll pay for the birth of our nation with our blood. That is normal. The best of us will fall, that is certain. There is only one thing for you to decide, whether we'll win or we'll lose. raised not 25 million dollars she raised 50 the money went directly to the capitals of the world where Ben Gurion had sent agents to purchase arms for the Haganah and in a converted museum one day before the scheduled pullout an historic event exiles from the land of Israel the Jewish people have returned believing in their self-evident right to be a nation like all other nations in their own sovereign state. I imagine every people that declares its independence goes through difficulties. But for us, there was such deadly danger that some of our friends strongly advised us not to proclaim independence. But we were determined to do it anyway. By virtue of this right, and of the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations. 
we hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine to be called Israel. The next day, May 15th, right on schedule, Israel was invaded by the armies of six countries. Weapons bought with the money Golda had raised began to arrive in chartered ships. Rifles, hand grenades, artillery pieces. One of the first ships brought 10 Messerschmitt fighter planes and aircraft mechanics from Czechoslovakia. In a few more days, the Arabs were being driven back or contained on all fronts. And with her work done, Golda flew home from America. Hello, Golda. I'm going to make a speech. It will be short, so don't expect much. All right, PG. <laughs> One day. When history is written, it will be recorded there was a woman who made it possible for the Jewish state to be born. In the United Nations General Assembly, the Arab countries now accepted a proposal for a ceasefire. It left Israel with some gains over the partition plan, but it divided Jerusalem with the old city in Jordanian hands. And despite the UN agreement, for the next 19 years, Jews were denied access to their holiest site, the Western Wall of Solomon's Temple. And the problem of the Palestinian refugees was created. I'm sure some Palestinian Arabs fled because they were frightened. But many left because their leaders told them to, promising that after we were driven into the sea, they would come back and take over Jewish property. Of course, we were not driven into the sea. And those people became homeless. None of the Arab countries would give them a home. Only two would even let them in, and they confined them to refugee camps. They are the only people in history to remain refugees after 30 years. Now, David Ben-Gurion was the first prime minister of Israel, and he appointed me to his cabinet as minister of labor. So, I needed an assistant. And a lady named Lou Kadar applied for the job. I speak English, French even better. I was born in France. How are you at writing letters? Oh, would you like to see a sample? I read that a Steve Doreen, company executive, just died. You might want to send a letter of condolence. What a beautiful letter. Did you know this man? Yes, actually. Was he as much of a saint as you say? Him? He was a son of a bitch. You might be very good at this job. Do you think you'd like working with me? I would love it. How do you know that you'd love it? I was with the Haganah. I, I was wounded. I haven't worked since I got out of hospital. Madam Minister, I'm tired of being hungry all the time. That's a good answer. All right, as far as I'm concerned, the job is yours. But I have to check with Ben-Gurion before it's definite. Oh, will that be a problem? Absolutely not. No problem at all. What's the name again? Kada. Lou Kada. Never heard of him. Her. The point is not whether you've ever heard of her. Correct. The point is you don't need her. I'm sending you a very fine man. He's been liaison to the Zionist office in Geneva. 
He can not only write you effective speeches in Hebrew, but also in English, and French, and Spanish. Plus, he's a very great administrator. He'll make your office run like a watch. His name is Rottenberg. Well, you seem to be very enthusiastic about him. I am enthusiastic about him. Fine. You take Rothenberg for your assistant, I'll take Luca Dark for mine. Israel had peace, or what was hoped would be peace, and with it, a tidal wave of immigrants. Jews, not only from Europe, but from Arab countries, from Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Tunisia, Morocco, Yemen, The Minister of Labor had to find them jobs. Shalom, Mr. Friedenthal. Shalom. How is it going? Well, Madam Minister, you have to understand that these men have held a brick or a cement block in their hands before. Mm -hmm. I do, of course. We depend on you to teach them. Well, they, they learn quickly. But I have a problem. Yes. In my group, there are ten men. And I speak only six languages. <laughs> to Golda personally, peace meant a little more time for everyday things, such as washing her hair as often as she liked. She also had a tea kettle that was never shiny enough for her. She told me she enjoyed polishing it when she was alone. If she felt lonely, she'd polish twice as hard. But as a cabinet minister, Golda had too many concerns to be alone very often. One developed from a visit to Israeli kibbutzim by United States Senator Hubert Humphrey. I must say I am impressed by what these teachers are accomplishing with retarded children. As you know, I have a particular interest in special education because of a grandchild. Yes, so I understand, Samir. Uh, may I ask you uh, another question, possibly a little sensitive? Certainly. What about these young couples living together who aren't married? Would you like to sit down, Senator? Personally, I never thought much about it. To me, the main thing would be if people love each other. Oh, Mrs. Meyerson, the main thing is the children. The children? Of course. What happens to the children of those couples? Are they accepted by your society, or are they stigmatized? Are they legally legitimate, or are they bastards? I don't think it's much of a problem for us. Why isn't it? Couples that aren't married tend not to have children. But that problem is even worse. Your country needs to increase its population, doesn't it? And a whole sector of your strongest and healthiest young people refuses to help. Senator, you're absolutely right. Look, we know who we are and what our commitment is. We don't need a piece of paper to tell us. You love each other. You have a commitment to each other. But it's the wrong being married to each other. Nobody says there's anything wrong with it. But nobody's going to push us into it. Push you into it. Who would ever do such a thing? Let me ask you, do you like this room you're living in? Mm, not very much. I thought not. Huh? Too close to the chickens. <laughs> would you like to be assigned a room near the flowers? Of course we would. I can arrange that. Oh, what about that icebox running all over the floor? I'm sure you wouldn't mind an electric fridge. I can arrange that, too. What's the catch? Catch? No catch. All I ask in return is something you yourself say nothing is wrong with. Get married. Would you come to the wedding, Golda? She went to many weddings and also to a funeral. In 1951, her husband Morris died. I remember thinking as though it weren't too late to tell him. Dear Morris, I loved you so in those early days. Things changed for us, but in a way, they stayed the same. I never lost that feeling for you, 
never. I thought how he loved our children, and they adored him. I thought, Maurice, at least we can be glad that Sarah's marriage is working out so much better than ours. But mainly, I kept thinking how very sad he was the last years of his life. And I was guilty, because I could always get him to do pretty much what I wanted. But I couldn't be the wife that he wanted and should have had. In the end, whatever I was able to accomplish, he paid for. Shalom, Maurice. Golda was Israel's labor minister for seven years, doing what she loved best, working with people to provide the solid things that people needed, like housing, and some of the things that turn a desert into a homeland, like trees. During that time, I suppose I became the typical doting Jewish grandmother. Some people said I was trying to make up for not having been a doting Jewish mother to my own children. <laughs> well, I suppose they were right. Anyway, between the joy that the children gave me and the satisfaction of doing my job, these were beautiful years, the best of my life. With the coming to power of Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, the end of Golda's beautiful years was inevitable. From bases around Israel's borders, Nasser sent terror squads called Fedayeen to stage indiscriminate attacks, such as the killing of six children and their teacher in an agricultural school. The official Cairo radio made Nasser's intention clear. We O oh Israel, the day of your extermination draws near. We have found the way to strike you. There will be no more arguments at the United Nations. There will be no peace. We demand the death of Israel. And violence even found its way into the Israeli parliament. saved Ben-Gurion's life that day. For the rest of her life, she carried shrapnel in her leg. So, I can believe what they told me. You're right. I'll be back in the office tomorrow, if I live. If not, I'll be back the day after. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Golda, speaking of living, I didn't want to mention this while your husband was alive, but you still haven't taken a Hebrew name. Well, I see no reason to change Myerson. It's policy, Gold. You know well that every member of the government is expected to have a Hebrew name, and especially someone with your high visibility outside Israel, which is going to be even higher. What is this now, BG? Moshe Sharet is leaving the cabinet to become secretary general of the Labour Party. Who is going to be foreign minister? You? No. I can't believe you mean such a thing. I certainly mean it. No, no. No, in the first place, I don't want to leave the Labour Ministry. That's my kind of work. Not a foreign ministry. It's full of sophisticated intellectuals with Oxford and Cambridge education. How could I fit in with them? You will make them fit in with you. I know you will. You know, uh, when somebody asked me how I could make a woman my foreign minister, you know what I said? I said, Golda, he's the best man in my cabinet. Excuse me, BG, if I'm not wild about uh, the compliment. Fine, don't be wild, but don't be your stubborn self either. You're taking over as foreign minister and that's that. I am stubborn, huh? Now, about changing your name. 
I thought of a name that's very close to Myerson. Meir. It's a fine old Hebrew word that means... It means to illuminate, to, to shed light. Golda Meir, golden light. You should give this your most serious consideration. Anything else I should do? Yes, you must understand that it is not in my nature to make a fuss about what you did for me as much as I appreciate it. Don't you think I know that? And another thing, there must be no argument about it. You've got to take a little better care of yourself. Don't be in such a hurry to, to come back to work. Go and spend some time in a nice hotel on the seashore. Rest. Relax. Let your leg heal. Caesarea is a nice place. No argument, B. G. I'll do exactly as you say. A week should be more than enough. Almost as soon as Golda Meyerson became Golda Meir, Israel's second foreign minister, she had the problem of Israel's second war. The Arab leaders had never accepted peace. Egypt's President Nasser had nationalized the Suez Canal and closed it to Israeli ships. And he was staging a massive military buildup with weapons supplied by the Soviet Union. On October 29, 1956, under the command of Chief of Staff Moshe Dayan, the Israeli army, mostly reservists, crossed into the Sinai Peninsula. They took the Gaza Strip, plus the entire Sinai, in less than a hundred hours. But military victory turned into political defeat at the United Nations. Israel came under intense pressure to withdraw. And in response to United, United Nations, Nations guarantees of freedom of navigation for Israeli ships, and all shipping in the Gulf of Aqaba, and an end to terrorist raids. My government is prepared to announce plans for a full and prompt withdrawal from the Sinai and the Gaza Strip. Now, may I add a few words to the neighbors of Israel? Can we, from now on, all of us, turn over a new leaf? Can we act like sisters and brothers should? Instead of fighting each other, can we fight poverty, disease, illiteracy? Hatred has never made one child in your countries happier. The implements of death has never converted a hovel into a house. Isn't it, Isn't it possible, possible that we that could we put, put all, all our, our efforts, efforts, our energies into one, into one single purpose, purpose the, betterment the betterment of all our lands and all our people, people through the blessings, blessings of peace? There was some polite applause, but not from the Arabs. So I knew we were making a mistake to withdraw. There would be no peace. Our soldiers who were killed and wounded had only bought us a little time, and we would have to fight again. Thank you, Thank Mr. Mr. President. President. In the 1960s, there was only one woman foreign minister in the world, and almost anybody in the world could tell you her name was Golda. Golda traveled to the capitals of Europe, to the United States and Canada, to Latin America, Japan, the Philippines, Burma, Ethiopia, and other places. I traveled with her, and I believe she felt that of all the continents, she was able to accomplish the most in Africa.
Golda set up a program for thousands of Africans to come to Israel to study subjects like hydrology and agriculture. And thousands of Israeli doctors, engineers, and technical specialists were sent to Africa. Mrs. Mayor, my question is, why is Israel going to the considerable expense of this program? Israel is a small and poor nation that has learned some hard lessons about economic and social development. We feel the responsibility to share what we've learned with other small and poor nations. Mrs. Mayer, that sounds very nice, but I am from Algeria. Your country is being armed by France. That government is fighting a brutal and ruthless war against our people. How do you justify your intimacy with a power that's the enemy of self-determination for the African people? Our neighbors are out to destroy us. They get up-to-date weapons from the Soviet Union, free of charge. Most of our friends, for whatever reason, won't sell us arms. The only country that will sell to us and for a lot of hard currency, let me tell you, is France. If President de Gaulle was the devil himself, I would expect my government to buy from him what we need to defend ourselves. And if you were in my position, sir, what would you do? Madam, at least you live up to your publicity, which says that you are honest. <laughs> you come, come now, come. Just a minute. All right, Bobby. What's all right? We don't know where they're taking you. Don't worry, Bobby. Mrs. Cadell, maybe they let a woman in that hut. I mean, how do we know what they may do to her? From Kiev and Pinsk and Milwaukee. <laughs> what happened? I'm now a member of the secret society of the Zoe Tribes women. I'm the only foreign woman they have ever admitted. <laughs> oh, you I must have a photograph of my grandchildren. Oh, yes, we take a picture, but uh, what went on in that hut? Oh, it is a secret society. It was a secret ceremony. I'll never tell. <laughs> And she never did. And then, do you know what he wanted? Are we still talking about Idi Amin? Yes, yes, Idi Amin, the machine gunner. <laughs> when I told him I couldn't give him six fighter planes, he asked for 10 million pounds sterling. <laughs> Oh, I couldn't stop <laughs> laughing. <laughs> and well, then he threatened to go to the enemy, meaning Libya. <laughs> I should have handled it better, but... <laughs> Gordy, you never chat. Hmm? What? Chat. Small talk. Especially at a dinner like this, you never do. 
You want a chat, huh? No. Chat. Chat. Well, you, you know that uh, Gabby wants a divorce. I think if uh, she has a chance to be happy with somebody else, by all means, she should take this chance. I think we should have the same chance. Older, after the divorce, would you marry me? Hmm? Now, this isn't fair. You say chat. Is this a subject for chatting? Compared to Idi Amin? I don't know what to say. I must sleep on it. I must wash my hair and think. Oh, we both have such important work. Golda, stop but thinking But being about married work. would interfere. Isn't it too late for us, anyway? Start thinking about yourself for a change, hmm? before it really is too late. Good morning, Lou. Oh, beautiful day, huh? No, it won't be too hot. It'll be just perfect. Listen, Lou, dear, will you have my car brought a little early this morning? I have a breakfast appointment with the... with someone. Hmm? 7.30. Fine. Thank you. Mrs. Mayor, my name is Kedem. I'm the manager of the apartment building. Yes. Uh, Mr. Ariel introduced us once. Yes, yes, I know you, Mr. Kedem. But what happened? We don't know yet. Mr. Ariel asked his aide for a wake-up call, but he didn't answer. So I went up and opened the door. It looked like he must have died soon after he went into the apartment. After the death of Ariel, Golda seemed to be trying to bury herself in work. I thought she might succeed, but she collapsed a few times from what was obviously exhaustion. I finally got her to go for a checkup by the same kind of gentle persuasion she used on her cabinet colleagues. 
I swore up and down, if she didn't, I'd quit. Those lumps don't mean anything, do they? They do. They do. No, let's see. What you have, according to the biopsy, is a disease of the lymphatic system called lymphoma. Malignant lymphoma. Malignant, I understand. It'll spread. Eventually, it penetrates the other systems. How much longer do I have? It's not a rapidly metastasizing condition. I'd say you have a good few years ahead of you. Well, I'm 66. How long can I expect to live anyway? But the question is, those few years, will they really be good or will I be suffering? There's very little pain associated with this disease, Mrs. Mayer. There'll be no real suffering for most of its cause. What about my mind? Your mind? I don't want to live one minute after my mind isn't clear. Your mind won't be affected. What must I do? Practically nothing. Your motor and sensory abilities are not impaired, so we won't go in for heavy chemotherapy this time. Just a few simple drugs. Drugs? What drugs? Well, listen, doctor, I'm a person who can't even take aspirin. We'll discuss each one as we come to it. Will they make my hair fall out? One or two, quite possibly. No, no, absolutely not. No, I don't care. I won't take any drug that will make me lose my hair. All right, all right. If you feel that way, we'll avoid those medications and go to different ones. Good. And I'll trust you. On one condition. If anything about this is ever going to be told to anyone, I will choose who and when. Otherwise, it is a strict secret between you and me. Is that agreed, Dr. Lander? Agreed, Mrs. May. Oh, another thing. Yes. Would it hurt you to call me gold, I like everybody else? Well? Well, it's what you said. A slight case of exhaustion. That's all? You're not satisfied with your own diagnosis? All right. It's also complications with the shrapnel in my leg. What are you going to do about that? Retire. Again, Golda, when? Why shouldn't I? Because you'd be bored to death. Come on, Golda. Can you see yourself out of politics, much less retired? Yes, I can see myself with books that I've been wanting to read. Go to the theater, to a movie. I like the movies, you know. I can see myself with my grandchildren, spending time I never could with my children. Always looking at my watch. Do I have to go the way I'm forever rushing now? Why not, Lou? Because Ben Gurion is retiring. That's enough of a loss for the country for a while. They say that Levieshko will replace him, is that right? Probably. What will you do if uh, Levieshkal asks you to stay on, which he certainly will? How can you desert a brand new prime minister of your own party? It's uh, less than two years to the next elections. I suppose if Eshkol needs me, I'll stay that long. But not longer. 
Time is precious to me now. Golda stayed on the two years, then resigned, and was succeeded as foreign minister by Abba Ibn. But her retirement didn't last long. From commanding positions on the Golan Heights, Syrian artillery had been shelling Israeli villages across the border below. One of the worst attacks was on the kibbutz of Gadot in the spring of 67. Golda, come this way. This way. Please. Twenty people died in here. Plus the people in five houses that were hit by shells. Plus the kindergarten building and two nurseries. Total stop. casualties. Let's go stop. This ambulance is ready to go. Send another ambulance up here. Why? Why did I have to see this? I'm retired. I'm a private citizen. It was bad enough to hear it on the radio. Why did you send the car for me? Because I want you to have a clear picture of what's happening here. I want you to hear it from Diane. Golda, in addition to the threat from Syria, Jordan is filling up with Iraqi forces, including planes and pilots. The King of Jordan just placed his forces under the command of an Egyptian general. Egypt now has got troops along our border, as in 56, and more tanks, Golda. There is a very big difference. This time, there are the United Nations troops between us, a buffer. Nasser ordered the UN out, Golda. They, they won't leave. The UN gave us guarantees. They are leaving. Our observation plans spotted them at first light this morning. The UN is moving out. As soon as they are gone, Nasser will close the straits and choke off a lot again. He says so. If we accept all this, we might as well cut our throats. Tell me what I can do. Come back to work, Golda. Well, Abba Eben is running the foreign ministry very well. I am not saying run the foreign ministry. I am saying run the party. We're splitting at the seams with all our differences. If you were Secretary General, you could unite the party like nobody else. What do you say, Golda? Of course. Hello. Kibbutz Revivim. Oh, Golda. What's the situation? Can you tell us anything? Shlomo, what can I tell you? Everybody that isn't mobilized is out in the park digging trenches. I've never seen such tension in my life. Can I speak to my daughter? Sarah? Sarah is out in the desert, feeling sandbags. But she's okay? She's feeling fine? She's fine. And the children, have they had enough drills? Do they know to run to the shelters? They know, they're well trained. Listen, Golda, is the government considering that the best thing might be to sit tight and wait? Wait for what? For Russia to send the Arabs more tanks? Yesterday, the Arab radio said, quote, the aim is to wipe Israel off the map. Today, they told Diane that they would put out his other eye. Should we wait for them to come and do it? We didn't wait. On the following Monday morning, the Six-Day War began. In the first three hours, Israeli planes knocked out almost the entire Egyptian air force. In the first three days, Israel took the Gaza Strip and the entire Sinai. It was the 1956 campaign all over again, but with differences. This time, Israeli soldiers took the concrete bunkers of the Syrians on the Golan Heights. And when King Hussein of Jordan joined the Arab attack, Israel took all of Jordanian-held Palestine, including the old city section of Jerusalem. After 19 years, Jews were able to visit their holiest site, the Western Wall. Now I remember thinking, 
We have defensible borders again. Is there anyone who would dare tell us to give them up again without a real guarantee of peace? And go home and start preparing our nine and ten-year-olds for the next war. No. No, not this time. I'm new in this route. Welcome to my bus. Well, what are you doing? Goldemar, you shouldn't have to carry groceries. Oh, Goldemar, you can carry groceries like anybody else. Oh, I'm a private citizen again, thank God. I'm sure he doesn't know it yet. Wait till he finds out. That little house on Baron Hill Street? Mm, yes, yeah, now I can enjoy it. I'm taking you to your door. Oh, no, Mr. Lazar. Oh, please, you're not allowed. Uh-uh. I am capable of walking home from the bus stop. You're too tired from shopping. I'm not tired. Well, I'm tired from the thought of letting you walk. If you're tired, then drive yourself home. <laughs> OK. Will the cabinet give me a vote of confidence to drive Golda home? you must feel, but some of us were just to the Knesset. And everybody is saying there's only one solution. Golda must come back. What are you talking about? You don't know. What? Levi Eshko. He had a heart attack. And he's dead. My dear God! Eshko! Mrs. Mayor, would you be willing to take over as Prime Minister? I don't even know what you're saying. Please leave me alone. But, but Mrs. Mayer, we must all ask Everybody seems to feel you're the only one who could unite the country. Eshko said I was the only one who could unite the party. Now it is the whole country. Oh. I came here to live on a kibbutz and help to build a homeland in a plain and simple way. I don't want to be prime minister. Golda, if you don't take the job, the leading contenders will practically fight a civil war over it. That's all we need. It's enough the Arabs insist they're still at war with us. Well, who knows if I would be elected anyway. I'm a 70-year-old grandmother. No matter. You're in good health, right? Well, being 70 is no joke. <laughs> but it's no sin either. I did enjoy my retirement. Yeah. The hell you did. She was elected by a vote of 70 to nothing. Some of our friends in other countries have expressed concern that Israel, by maintaining strong armed forces, may become militaristic. I can only answer that I'm not in favor of a nice, liberal, anti-militaristic 
and dead Jewish people. On the other hand, the victories that we have won have never intoxicated us. They've never made us forget our great hope, our great desire, which is for peace. A peace that means good neighborly relations with the Arab people is fundamental for the Jewish Renaissance. With all my heart, I pledge that this government will make every effort in its power to bring about a true and enduring peace. In October, Golda accepted President Nixon's invitation to visit the United States. There was a spit and polish ceremony watched on television in Israel with great pride. Madam Prime Minister and our guests here at the White House today, the problems of the Mideast are terribly complex and not susceptible to solution in one meeting or two meetings or three meetings or even more at the level at which we will be talking. We know that your neighbors want peace. How do you like my Golda? Huh? She's Golda. <laughs> I think your father is falling in love. I would. We shall have but what a line I'd have to stand in. <laughs> in Jerusalem, her typical day would begin in the office and continue at home. Often she would meet with one group of cabinet ministers in the kitchen over an international problem and at the same time with other ministers in the dining room over a domestic problem. She was supposed to go to bed by midnight. It didn't always happen. Come and get me. Did you order the white coats? Yes, I ordered the white coats. But what's the point of all this secrecy? Suppose it does come out that your leg is bothering you. What of it? Politicians have a way of blowing things out of all proportions. Do you feel better now? What we have to do now is to go into the therapy we have already discussed. I have arranged for it to begin now. No. Ah, oh, Golda. Let's not have you being transigent about it. Put it on. Everybody puts coats on. May I ask why, Mrs. See, you look like doctors in a hospital. Four doctors attract less attention than four ex-paratroopers. And Lou, please, don't worry. Don't worry. Either that or you stay here. Put the coats on. You look very nice, Avi. Your mother always wanted you to be a doctor, didn't she?
treatments uh, twice a week. I have arranged them for after midnight. And if there are leaks? We are treating you for the shrapnel in your legs. Remember, it makes my hair fall out. Just one hair. This is a very important man. He holds the key vote on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Friendly or not friendly? Well, said to be a friendly type, uh, personally. On Israel, however, not sympathetic. Never has been. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. I am Simcha Dinitz, Mrs. Mayor's political secretary. Nice to meet you. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. Prime Minister, how do you do? And I'm very happy to meet you, Senator. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Would you care for a coffee? Yes, thank you. And uh, a little something to go with it? Are you hungry? Uh, no, coffee's fine, thank you. What's she doing out there? Making coffee. You mean herself? And if I know her, a little something to go with it. Excuse me. Madam Prime Minister. Cake looks good. Mm, my own recipe. No one is ever hungry. But when I serve honey cake, they don't refuse. Now, sit down. There. I'll try some of my apricot jam with it. There, I'll just bring this out to the boys and I'll be right back. Mm. If you don't like the menu, it's your own fault. I told you to go home. Well, you know, we have to be relieved. But I don't need anybody today. I won't be going out anymore. Well, do we have our orders. But I won't tell anybody. I promise. <laughs> 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 dishes? You can help me, Senator, but not with the dishes. Well, in addition to the Starfighter, I think we can get congressional approval to sell no, the The Starfighter is not the plane we need. What's wrong with it? The Egyptians are flying Russian MiG-21s with a speed of 1380 miles per hour, comparable to the Starfighter. And it has a range of 680 miles. Better than twice the Starfighters. Also, 
a starfighter is an unstable airplane with an unacceptable record of crashes. We can't afford to lose pilots in combat, let alone in accidents. No, the plane we need is the Phantom. Let's talk tanks. The Egyptians have the Russian T-62, an excellent tank. It's faster than your M551 Sheridan and has heavier armor. But the Sheridan has a heavier cannon. Yes. But the Sheridan is too light for the recoil of such a heavy cannon. It shakes the laser rangefinder out of enlightenment. And also the Sheridan has a blind spot at the range of 1,000 to 1,200 yards. Oh, Senator, please. Sell us the M60. My dear lady, how do you keep up on all this? Old Senator, don't you think I'd rather be up on schools, housing, farming, industry? But we have no choice. After the Six-Day War, we pleaded with the Arabs to negotiate peace. And they came back with our famous three no's. No negotiation. No recognition of Israel, no peace. And the situation of the PLO is that Israel must be destroyed, even within its pre-war boundaries. I don't think the United States will ever let that happen. Hmm. Oh, you remind me of your wonderful President Kennedy. May he rest in peace. He said to me, Mrs. Mayer, nothing will happen to Israel. We are committed to you. And I said to him, Mr. President, I believe you 100%. I just want to make sure that by the time you honor your commitment, we are still there. All right. What about the recipe for your honey cake? Egyptian build-up is along the full length of the Suez Canal. It amounts to 100,000 men and over 2,000 tanks. And what do we have? Without calling up the reserves? 8,500 men. 276 tanks. The Syrians have 45,000 men against our 5,000. 1,700 tanks against our 176. What does intelligence say? We don't see the Syrians attacking us. We think they somehow got the idea we may attack them. And uh, Egyptian buildup. If Nasser was still alive, we'd be concerned. But Anwar Sadat is a cooler head. Sadat simply has his army on maneuvers. And nobody thinks we should call up the reserves? Is this because nobody wants to upset the country three days before Yom Kippur? Oh, it is not a matter of Yom Kippur, Gonda. Our best intelligence, including input from the Americans, is uh, there will be no war. What do I know about it, anyway? My instincts tell me to mobilize. But the facts are that it would cost millions and just about cripple industry, business, essential services. So how can I follow my instinct? Especially when the best military minds in the country advise against it. Oh, Lou, I must be getting old. Advice never stopped me before. 
But it wasn't only the general staff. We had a cabinet meeting. And the vote was against mobilization. Unanimously. So, Toots, there you are. Excuse me. This just came. Oh, thank you, Avi. Go home to your family. Yom Kippur will, will soon be here. Shalom. Shalom. Another intelligence report. <sighs> Soviet transport planes are in Syria, evacuating the families of Russian military advisors. This does not alter our current assessment of the situation. On the eve of Yom Kippur, the most sacred of all Jewish holidays, many Jews traditionally have a family dinner before the fast begins. This year, I just couldn't sit at the table. I left early and went to bed. Yes? Golda, this is Talmi, Army Intelligence. We have reliable information that Syria and Egypt will both attack this afternoon. They have amassed troops and aircraft on the Golan Heights and near the Suez Canal. Have you informed Ayan and Dado? Yes. They've made a staff decision to call up reserve units for the defense line immediately. Every man in the country between the ages of 18 and 55 will be called. They say they need your approval for the next phases. And how soon can they meet you in your office? How soon? For the moment, all I could think was, I will never forgive myself. I should have overruled the cabinet and everybody else and mobilized yesterday. But it was a little late for that. I'm on my way. The first decision concerns calling up additional units at this time. Call them up. On the next point, the defense minister and I are not in agreement. Golda, our Air Force can strike at noon if you give me the green light. That would be a preemptive strike. I'm against it because it would get us labeled the aggressors. Three brilliant generals and I have to decide. Yes, because this is not a military issue. It is strictly political. Started. I know that your approach can save lives up front. But we don't know about the future. Suppose it turns out that we need help. If we strike first, we'll get nothing from anyone. No preemptive strike. That's it. At 2 p.m., on Yom Kippur Day, the Syrians shelled Israeli positions and then attacked. In the south, the Egyptians crossed the Suez Canal along its entire length. The first three days of fighting threatened disaster for Israel. The Egyptian army overran Israel's strong points on the renowned Barlev line. Their armored columns raced toward the critical desert passes. In the north, the situation was even worse. The Syrian army broke through on the Golan Heights, heading for the farm settlements below. Yes, Golda. Well, has the airlift started? Uh, not yet. What do you mean, not yet? You should have seen our kids going off to the front, not knowing they may have no air cover. I'm aware of that. Oh, Simcha. You can't imagine how... how actually frightening the situation is. We have already lost almost half of our fighter planes. 
No, not in air battle, but to missiles. Russian missiles against us on both fronts. And our tank losses are just as bad. Kolda, the Defense Department does not want to send us arms in U.S. cargo planes. I'm shopping around for other... It's too late for shopping. President Nixon promised to help us if we needed help. Tell him we do. And it has to be today. Tomorrow, we may be completely overrun. Call Kissinger and tell him. Call the senator who liked my cake. Call them right now. Golda, do you know what time it is here? I'm not sleeping, God knows, but they are. Tell Kissinger he can sleep when the war is over. Richard Nixon kept his promise. He personally ordered C-5 galaxies to deliver tanks, rockets, and medical supplies. The fighter planes, denied permission to land in any of the European democracies for refueling, were refueled in flight. And on the ninth day of the war, the airlift reached Israel. Our losses were devastating. But rearmed by the airlift, Israeli forces took the offensive. I remember thinking, thank God, we rejected the temptation to strike first. Yes? Dardo! Where are you? The canal! With Shaka's division. Oh, don't be such a hero. You're the chief of staff. You're supposed to be in the map room. Diane and I are just looking things over. Listen, Golda. Can you hear me? Yes? We're back to being ourselves. And they are back to being themselves. And Golda, it will be all right. On this 10th day of the war, I can tell you we have a task force across the canal operating in the Egyptian territory. I want to express our deep gratitude to the president and the people of the United States. By the 16th day, Israel had retaken virtually all of the Sinai held a large area across the canal and had the Egyptian Third Army completely encircled. In the north, Israel had regained all of the Golan and moved into Syria, within 25 miles of Damascus. At this point, the Soviet Union began pressing for a ceasefire. And at kilometer 101 in the Sinai Desert, at a meeting arranged by the United Nations, an armistice was signed. But in spite of the military victory, the mood in Israel was bleak and bitter. Battle casualties were the heaviest since the 1948 War of Independence. A kind of national trauma set in. My son, when you called him up, you ran off in such a hurry, he forgot his dog tags. So if he's dead, how will I ever know? My son took his drugs. Why don't I know? If he's dead, where is his body? If he's not dead, if he's a prisoner, why can't anybody tell me? We are getting a prisoner of war list from the Egyptians very soon. That's the agreement. From the Syrians, I don't know. They won't agree even to that. Every one of us was in the fighting. We saw our friends die next to us. We have the right to ask. Just when we had the enemy on the run, why did you agree to that ceasefire? I wanted to hold out for a true negotiated peace this time. I have spent my life pleading for peace. We are a very small country with a great and powerful friend. Sometimes we have to give in to that friend, even when we don't want to. We blame you for the war, because the country wasn't prepared. You should resign. 
and so should he. Defence Minister Dayan offered to resign three times. I insisted that he stay. Murderers! Murderers, both of you. Do you want to know what I tell my children? I tell them you killed their father. Do they think we don't care? There is no way to fight a war without losses, especially when the other side suddenly attacks. The Americans had Pearl Harbor, the French the Maginot Line, the British Dunkirk. Those people seem to understand. Those people are not like our people. Do you think, Diane, that's why God chose us? I've told my key people I would die. Well, I better mean it this time, isn't that right, Hein? Yes, yes, I suppose so. Well, I'm ready. I've done about everything I had hoped to. And got yourself voted woman most admired in America. You couldn't have planned on that. Woman most admired. <laughs> Would Morris have voted for me? You know, if I had my life to live over, maybe there is something I would change. I think I would have stayed on the kibbutz. But what would the country have done without you? No, believe me, Israel would have come through anyway. And I would have been more at peace with myself my whole life. Why did you decide not to be a prime minister anymore? Well, there was a number of reasons. But one of them was, I was beginning to imagine that people around me were whispering, for God's sake, when is this old woman going to make up her mind? That it's time for her to leave. <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't all imagination. <laughs> You never wanted to be a prime minister, did you? Right. I became one, just like my milkman, became a commander of a machine gun squad in the 73 year. Believe me, he didn't want that job. But somebody had to do it. You think there will ever be peace between Israel and those other countries? Yes. I believe. We must believe that there will be peace someday. When will that be? When? Well, I can tell you. When the Arabs love their children more than they hate us, that's when peace will come. call was from Dennis. They want you to cancel the rest of your trip and come home. Who's they? Everybody. What everybody? How about your friends and your enemies? <coughs> Gorda, Sadat is coming to Jerusalem. Begin is going to meet him at the airport and bring him to address the Knesset. Sadat is actually coming? Not just talking about it? I'm not in the government. Now, what do they need me for? Need you? It's history. You're part of it. Oh, I'm ancient history. But if Sadat really wants to talk peace, I'd like to see somebody try to keep me away.
I have chosen this difficult road, which is considered by many, and in the opinion of many, the most difficult road. I have chosen to come to you with an open heart and an open mind. I have chosen to present to you and in your own home the realities devoid of any scheme or whim, not to maneuver or win a round, but for us to win together. The most dangerous of rounds and battles in modern history, the battle of permanent peace based on justice. This wonderful step that President Sadat has taken by coming here proves that speaking to each other through middle persons is not the same as meeting face to face. On our differences about the Palestinians, I believe there is a solution in a peace treaty with Jordan that will be good for them and safe for us. And now, I want to say something to President Sadat. As an old lady, <laughs> I would say this. <laughs> you always called me the old lady. You know? <laughs> As an old lady, my great hope is to live to see the day of peace between you and us, between all our neighbors and us. And as a grandmother to a grandfather, <laughs> Although you are just a new grandfather, I have a little gift for your granddaughter. Let us hope that through our genuine efforts in Geneva, we can uh, uh, breach the rift that has taken place between us and uh, 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 establish peace once and for all on the two main points that I have mentioned to you now. Security and um, no more war. Whatever happens between us, we must sit and solve through peaceful negotiations. Again, I must not end my words without thanking Mrs. Mayer for this kind gesture. Let us hope that the peace process that we have started, Mrs. Mayer and me, will continue and flourish and will uh, give satisfaction to every girl, every woman, every man in Israel and the Arab world. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Ahmoud M. Hamdi, Deputy Foreign Minister of Egypt. President Katsir, President Sadat, Prime Minister Mr. Gbegin, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
How exciting to be here in the holy city of Jerusalem at such an important time in history. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor to present to you the President of Israel, His Excellency Ephraim Katsir. By the time they get to you, are you going to remember what you wanted to say? Did you ever know me when I didn't have something to say? As we stand on the threshold of peace, we pray for wisdom. And now, it is my privilege to present a truly great lady of our time, or any other time. She has been called the mother of Israel, the earth mother of her people. But mostly, she is called Golda. Ladies and gentlemen, Golda Meir. If I'm supposed to be the mother of Israel, earth mother, or whatever kind of mother, I have the responsibility to be a good one. And what a good mother would say to you now is, it's late, everybody's tired, go home. <laughs> Mr. President, I'll say good night. Good night, dear lady. I hope we see each other again soon. I'm glad you came. I'm glad too. Very glad I came. So, let me ask you, what took you so long? A lot of people said and wrote a lot of things about her, such as, the miracle of Golda was that she embodied the spirit of so many people, the hopes, fears, ideals, and stubbornness of Jews everywhere. But as usual, Golda said it better. Why am I known? Because of my wisdom, my great achievements, no. I'm known because at the time of struggle for the Jewish people, I was one of a group that made it possible to have what we have, what we've been able to defend by the skin of our teeth. I did what I thought was right, and that's that. And after me, someone else will come, and I hope they'll do better. Shalom. Gold up.